Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you're doing great and you are very excited for the upcoming exams. I tend to have a burst of energy around the examination period, so please forgive me. My students used to get mad at me for this uh, because I'd say, oh, the exams are so easy and they're so exciting and they would be really stressed. And I guess they probably thought that I was being um, uncompassionate to their struggle. So I am compassionate towards your struggle, but I do feel like the exam is a really good time for you to consolidate everything that you've learned so far and to be able to explain it in your own words in ways that would be acceptable to the examination board. So I believe everyone who's studying on this channel is trying to get an A, at least the minimum of a B. Oh, that's what I used to set for my class. The minimum was a B um, for my class. Um, so I hope that that's what you've set for yourself as well. So this video is only going to answer two questions um, from a paper four, and they're on chapters 17 and 18. The reason why I've chosen these two chapters in particular is that they are the two chapters that tend to stump students a lot. Students struggle to to, um, understand what the questions look like for these chapters so I figured I'd do a video on that um, and also I'm not doing the full video because um, for most of the full videos considering the amount of work that goes into it um, I will reserve for students who are on memberships but that doesn't mean if you're not on a membership that there's nothing to gain from the channel as you can see there is um, the entire syllabus is on there and there are some past paper questions and obviously some truncated ones such as these where you can have chapter specific solutions to some questions but um, maybe not the long full papers with detailed explanations as you might have had before um, and that's just because quantifying the amount of work that goes into it um, has led to this decision but I am pretty sure that you're still getting the best out of the channel. Um, something else I would like to say that is not related to this video at all is I've had some questions from students asking me if they have to learn hormonal coordination from chapter 14 for the 2022 exams. The answer to that is no, you don't have to. Um, for the 2022 syllabus, hormonal coordination, how the hormones are regulated and all of that has been removed from the syllabus. So you can go ahead and skip that section if it will make your reading a lot better. I'll do some tips on revision and also some tips on the mark schemes um, so that you know how to answer questions. But for now, let us just get into these two questions on chapters 17 and 18. So you already know chapter 17 and 18 have to do with biodiversity, selection, evolution, and all of that. And I believe that these chapters tend to be the least favorite for many students, but they are also chapters that you will find in the exam no matter what. And most of the time when you open your paper four paper, um, chapters 17 and 18 usually are chapter uh, number one, number two. Um, sometimes you you might have something easier at the beginning, but um, these these papers, th these questions or chapters rather, tend to come qu quite early and they carry a considerable amount of marks. Um, I think for this one, question one is about 10 marks and question two is another 10 marks. So that's already 20% of the paper. Your paper four is 100 marks. Um, so it is quite a lot. So let's look at the question and I'll try as much as possible to explain what I um, what you need to understand here. So it says 1A, the European eel, Anguilla, Anguilla, you don't need to worry about what the name is, is a fish. The sizes of eel populations tend to remain relatively stable despite eels producing large numbers of offspring. Suggest two reasons why the population sizes of eels tend to remain relatively stable. So one thing you can think of here is if you remember the video that I did on um, selection and evolution, we spoke about predation, right? And I think there was sort of like a graph with a fox and a... I think it was a fox and a rabbit or something along those lines. But what basically happens is that if a species um, starts to increase in number, then at some point the predator of that species, so I'm just going to um, use a different color. I think I'll use a black line. The predator of that species also starts to increase because it's basically there's more food available for the predator. So the predator increases in number and eats um, quite a lot of the species until the populations go down. And then the predator also goes down. So they follow the same trend. If you're confused by what I'm saying, please watch the videos on chapter, I think this is chapter 17. But the point of what I'm trying to say here is that perhaps one of the reasons why the population of the eels is 
is relatively stable is that when the eels increase in number um, they have predators that feed on them and that leads to, uh, feed on them to a certain extent until they reach a certain um, level in the population so that could be number one so that could be predation um, I'm going to go back to my red pen so it could be issues of predation um, it could also be and something else that I think chapter 17 uh, sometimes I get confused between which one's 17 and which one's 18 I think this is 17 um, evolution and natural selection um, something that the chapter doesn't really talk about is um, birth rates versus death rates right so if you say if the question says that the eels produce large numbers of offspring but for some reason their population tends to be the same it could be that the death rate is also high so if the death rate is high um you can say um if the death rate is high you can say that that means that the death rate and the birth rates are sort of equal and so for that reason the population stays stable so if they give birth to 10 eels then 10 eels and 10 eels die then the population just tends to stay the same um, so those are two reasons I would give um, and something else I want to say here that I've noticed in the mark schemes um, since the pandemic is that as much as you are encouraged to write out your answers in a form that um that is sort of easy for the reader and um, for the examiner to read so you can write it as one and two um the examiners are actually told now to read your answers in a prose form um, so that means you have to write this out in full sentences you can no longer just write this way which I think was preferred for a lot of students um, so you would have to stay, say for example here two reasons might be um, number one you can say um, first reason predation of the eel population might lead to relatively stable numbers um, perhaps and then number two you can say um, equal death rates um, equal death and birth rates might be leading to relatively stable population numbers um, so that's all that you need to write out there so just try to write out in full sentences um, as much as you can something else I have to say is please do not write beyond the space that has been provided I always say this to students the moment you start to write beyond the space provided you are probably writing something wrong so don't go overboard trying to explain make sure you're very succinct or you're very clear and direct with your response and just put your answers in also take note of the number of marks um, that you have and what the question is asking you for if it says suggest two reasons simply write two reasons don't write four reasons and then hope that out of those four the examiner will look for the two that are correct and then mark those um, because for the most part if you're writing too many things there's a chance you're contradicting yourself and the examiners have been told to now check um, every answer that you give so even if you write four answers here they have to read everything and if there's any contradiction then you don't get any marks so make sure that your answers are direct and they're very clear um, number one B what is meant by the general theory of evolution so the general theory of evolution I think this is really easy it is the fact that um, populations increase in number um, that they change over time um, that they undergo evolution so just um, the general theory of evolution is basically just think of the fact that organisms um, grow in number um, they undergo mutations um, and obviously this might not be directly what's in the mark scheme but I, pr I promise you that the answers are correct um, so organisms grow in number or rather they change um, they change over time so if you think of human species the way we've changed there was homo habilis homo erectus and then um, homo sapien which is what we are supposedly qualified as um, so organisms change they undergo natural selection please mention natural selection because that is very important for evolution the only organisms that are able to evolve are the organisms that have been naturally selected or are adapted for survival um, so that's um, that's always important to mention when you discuss evolution and again you only have to write two things write them out in full sentences um, but you don't have to write a whole story but but just make sure that you've written two clear points that can easily be seen um, and here it says explain okay so you are explaining so you write it in prose form um, you don't have to number it okay you just write it out in prose form so that is that 
Okay, let's look at question C. It says here, the generation time of a species is the mean average time from one generation, that's the parents, to the next generation, which is the offspring. For example, the generation time of humans is about 25 years, which means you actually have 25 years between generations. Um, and so it says there, figure 1.1 shows a graph of the relationship between the rate of evolution and the generation time for a wide range of different species. The question then goes to say, describe and explain the relationship shown in figure 1.1. I'm going to tell you a little bit about describe and explain and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this in previous videos but I see that students still tend to make the same mistakes with these kinds of things so I'm going to make sure that I explain it. When you are asked to describe, describe means look at the graph or the image or whatever it is that you've been given and tell us what you see. So if, if it's a graph for example tell us the trend that you observe. Explain means that you use your understanding of biology to explain either the effect of what you're observing or the principle behind what you're observing. So if you're looking at a graph, you can sort of say, okay, based on what I see on this graph, this would be the effect or based on what I see on this graph, this is the principle behind it or this, these are the facts um, that surround such a graph. So please make sure that when you're asked to describe, you actually describe. When you're asked to explain, you don't describe because sometimes students are asked to explain something and they start to describe it and so they end up not getting any marks. Describe and explain means that you do both. So in this case here, um, it says describe and explain the relationship. So let's describe first of all. Let's look here. This is generation time on the x-axis and the rate of evolution on the y-axis. When generation time is low, the rate of evolution is high. And remember, we just spoke about what evolution is. We said evolution means that organisms are changing over time and they are responding to the laws of natural selection. So that means that when generation time is low, the rate of evolution, which is the rate at which organisms are changing, is quite high, right? But when generation time is high, the rate of evolution becomes lower, okay? So it means the rate at which organisms are falling uh, responding to the laws of um, evolution is quite low. And maybe that's why we humans haven't evolved into anything else. Um, and I'm pretty sure it would be scary if for some reason someone started to evolve into a dragon. Um, not that that's possible, but just saying that it would be really terrifying. Okay, so let's look at this graph then. So what, do we dis what have we observed? What are we describing? We are saying that we we've observed that when the rate of um, when the generation time is low, so I'm just going to write it as low gen time, okay, the rate of evolution is high, so high rate of evolution, okay, and vice versa. Obviously, you don't have to, you shouldn't write vice versa, um, you should write it out if you want to. Um, if the generation time is high, the rate of evolution is low. So that means if you now want to explain this, you can say high generation times um, means that high gen time is equal to low evolution. Please don't write in um, shorthand like I'm doing. And something else you should know is that in CIE, all your spellings don't have to be correct, but they must not be confusing. So you can't write evolution and evolutionary. You have to sort of make sure that you're clear. So high generation time, low evolution. If the high gen, if the if there's low evolution, that means that there is less changes. There are less changes happening, rather. There are less changes happening in the DNA. I'm just going to write changes like that. Less changes are happening in DNA. Um, and in biology, we don't call them changes. We actually say that they are mutations. And why are the mutations less? Because the DNA is replicating at a much slower rate for the next generation. So there would be less mutations. So you can also write um, low replication rates of DNA. So low rep rates of DNA. I promise you I write better than this with an actual um, pen, but this is me using my mouse. So 
Um, I hope that makes sense. So this is what we've done now. We've described what we can see and we've also explained it that, well, based on what we can see, it means that there would be low changes, um, less changes in the DNA. And that means that the replication rates of the DNA would be lower. And so for that reason, the rate of evolution decreases. For evolution to happen really quickly, you need a high rate of mutations um, within the DNA between the generations that are coming. So that way they can respond very quickly to changes. But if generation time is a lot longer, then um, chances of them um, undergoing those high rates that are required, high, muta high levels of mutations that are required is a lot slimmer. So that is how you would answer this question. And again, you only have to write three points, but you can write them in a prose form. So you don't have to write them in numbers like I have done. I have a habit of writing this way, but I see now that your, your markers are being told to read your answers in prose form and to make sure that there are no contradictions before they award you any marks. Okay, now let's look at number D. It says here the Twatara Sphenodon punctuatus. Okay, this is, we're not in Harry Potter, so let's just move on. There's a reptile that is native to New Zealand. It is found nowhere else in the wild. So it is only found in New Zealand and that's what it looks like. They usually include these lovely images of animals and I guess that's to help you calm down during the exams, um, not because you necessarily have to see it to answer the question. Uh, but let's see, the question then says they have a slow grow rate, growth rate and can live for over 100 years. Fossil evidence shows that they have, there has been little morphological change in the Tuatara over the last 200 million years. This is a much slower rate of evolution that would be expected from the, genera from the generation time from the generation time of this species. Suggest and explain why the Tuatara has remained largely unchanged over the last 200 million years. So again, if you think about it, this, questions, this question is linked to the previous question we've just answered and to the question with questions we answered before that. Before that, we were asked, what is the natural theory? What is the theory of evolution rather about? And we said the theory of evolution is that organisms will change over time. They are subject to natural selection pressures. And so for that reason, um, they evolve in response to their environment, okay? That's more or less the theory of evolution. But here now we are being told that this organism hasn't changed for a long time. So what that's telling us, first of all, the first thing that comes to mind is that there are no selection pressures that are affecting it. So there's no reason for it to evolve. Okay, no selection pressures affecting the organism. We also spoke about the eel in question 1a where we said, well, the eel birth rate, death rate, um, does it have a predator and all of that. So perhaps the reason why this organism hasn't changed, because remember, one of the selection pressures organisms face in the environment is predation. Whenever there's a predator, and if you watch my videos on diversity, evolution, and all of that, you will understand this a bit better. Whenever there is um, a, pre a predator pressure, organisms tend to change themselves. So for example, if you have white rabbits in the forest, they are so easy to spot that if foxes were to hunt them down, they would kill all of them. The white rabbits will start to evolve to become maybe brown rabbits or green rabbits, if there's any such thing, so that they can be better hidden within the forest and they would not be easily seen. So if there is no selection pressure um, on the to a tara, um, that means that there has been no reason for it to change, or that can also mean that there has been no predation. All right, so you can actually say no predators. And so for that reason, each one can live for over 100 years because there's nothing that's haunting it down, all right? Um, another reason that you might want to give is that the Tuatara is simply, it's, it lives in an environment. So think about what the question has told us. It says it is native to New Zealand. It is found nowhere else in the world. So it is, it, you can then go on and say it is well adapted so being in New Zealand, so it is adapted to its environment. Okay, um, I hope you are able to understand these things I'm writing because I've never seen my writing look so bad. Um, 
so it is well adapted to its environment so for that reason it lives there it hasn't tried to migrate anywhere else because of that it doesn't have any predators there are no selection pressures on it so it will remain unchanged there's no need for it to evolve for that reason all right so i hope that makes sense let us go i think to the next question okay let's look at the second question it says the gray wolf canis lupus is a large predator during the 20th century, the grey wolf in southwest Europe was hunted almost to extinction. And then they give you a picture of the wolf. Again, please don't spend time looking at the picture, trying to figure out something and saying, oh, maybe it's because of its eyes or its mouth looks funny. Most of the time, I believe these questions or these pictures rather are put there to make you feel a little bit closer to the subject. Because for many students, chapters 17 and 18 can feel quite distant. Um, so don't spend your time worrying about that. Just skip to the question. And here the question says, state the genus of the gray wolf. So whenever you have a scientific um, name, be it of a plant or an animal, um, such as this one here, the first word is the genus of the animal or the plant. So in this case, that is canis. Okay, that's the first word. Then it says, suggest and explain the effect on biodiversity of Southwest Europe if the gray wolf becomes extinct. So in this case, I want you to think of it in terms of a food chain. The gray wolf is said to be a predator. It's a large predator. Okay, if the gray wolf becomes extinct, then it means whatever it preys on will increase in number. We, they haven't told us what it preys on. So it might lead to an increase in the number of its prey. It will lead to a destabilization of the genetics in the, in the wolf population. So if the gray wolf, for example, goes extinct, that reduces the genetic variation of the wolves in that area generally, because now you can't find the gray wolves and you don't know when that gene might be necessary for their evolution or for their adaptation to a, to their environment so that obviously um, affects that and obviously it reduces the biodiversity of the area in general so again here um, reduces biodiversity due to loss um, so because the question says suggest and explain you can just say it might reduce biodiversity you have to say it reduces biodiversity due to um, loss of the genus okay loss of the genus or the species or loss of the species because it's a very specific species of wolf um, it also reduces genetic variation in the wolf population uh, because of the lack of alleles for the new generations so I'm not going to um, write all of that out and I can see I'm writing generation instead of genetic variation um, so it reduces genetic variation and obviously the explanation is because you lose the alleles if the f wolves go extinct then their alleles are no longer in the environment all right um, it might lead to an increase in the prey um, because it says here it is a large predator so if it's a predator it means it helps to stabilize the population of a prey Okay, and we haven't been told what that prey is, but you can make assumptions about that. So it might lead to an increase, um, lead to increase of its prey. And if its prey, for example, happens to be another um, omnivore, or why am I writing this? I'm supposed to write prey. Um, if its prey, for example, is a carnivore, or an omnivore, then that has implications for the environment because if if they increase in number, then they place certain pressures on the environment. So that is how you would answer a question like this one. All right, so gray wolves can have territories up to 950 square kilometers. They can travel up to a thousand kilometers to start a new population. State reasons why the mark release recapture method is not suitable for estimating the size of a gray wolf population. So the mark release recapture method is a method whereby you go into a certain area and say, for example, you want to count the number of lions that are there. You can just capture a few lions and you put marks on them or you put like a thing like a brace around their necks 
but obviously the marks have to be harmless and then you release them into the environment and then you go back after a certain time you regather them you check the ones that have the mark the ones that don't have the mark and you do a calculation um, but in this case they're telling us that the gray wolves can travel up to a thousand kilometers to start a new population so it is safe to assume in this case that if you were to try to use the mark release recapture method that when you go back you might not have a representative sample of the gray wolf to estimate the population also if you think of the size of their territories it says they have territories that are 950 kilometers 50 square kilometers that's a large area it means that for you the person who's doing the study it would be difficult for you to even capture the wolves to start with because think about the distance you have to travel um, in order for you to even get these wolves together and if the territory is that large then there's a high chance that you are in danger, right? Because perhaps the reason why they spread out so much is because they are trying to ensure that they are protected and they're not all captured in the same area. So it means that there's a potential that they are dangerous animals. Um, they have a large territory, so it's hard for you to go in there and be able to capture enough of them. And because they can travel for such a long distance, there's a chance that by the time you go back, the population you marked might have migrated somewhere else. And so for that reason, you end up not being able to estimate their population. You only have to write two of those things. I've given you three, um, but that should do it. All right, let's go to the next question. I'm trying to make this video as short as possible. I'll see if I can do it in 35 minutes. So let's see. In 1992, new laws were re introduced across Southwest Europe to protect the gray wolf. Figure 2.2 shows the distribution of gray wolf populations in Southwest Europe in 1970 and in 2012. No gray wolves from the captive breeding from captive breeding populations were released into the wild in Southwest Europe during the period from 1970 to 2012. Um, so basically what that means is that they had like the laws that were introduced were probably like captive breeding laws, which meant that there were people who went into the wild, took some gray wolves and then put them in captive breeding situations, maybe such as zoos or um, protected um, environmental areas so that the wolves can breed with each other and make more numbers. Um, so that that's possibly what that means. And so between 1970 and 2012, they did not release any of these wolves into the environment. All right. So now key to the population. So we have the Iberian, we have the Syria, Morena, we have the Italian, we have the Alpine. But that means nothing if we don't know what the question is. So table 2.1 shows the sizes of the populations of gray wolves shown in figure 2.2. So number one is Iberian. I'm just going to use a blue pen here just because. So this is the Iberian population. The Sierra Morena is this one. Um, the Italian is that one. And for number four, we don't have any number four in 1970, but we do have in... Um, 2012 and just so you know the number three is also somewhere here for 2012 but my animation seems to have covered it um so here let's look at it it says size of population in 1970 you can see what the size is over there and then it asks you to calculate the percentage change the percentage change here should be a lot easy um, for you to calculate as biology students Population change um, or percentage change rather in this case is simply you take the final size, which is 2,500. I'm using a calculator here because there's one right next to me on my desk. Um, and you deduct the previous or the initial size, which is 700. And then you divide by the initial. All right. Make sure you divide by the initial and you multiply that by 100. So your answer should take you to around 200 and 57 and something I just want to say here is that you need to look at the trend of the answers that you've that have already been provided you can see over here that they say minus or they say plus so what they're asking you to do is to deduct or to tell them if it's increasing by a certain number or decreasing in this case it is increasing so we're just going to go ahead there and say it is plus 257 
all right you can also see that they're not putting any percentages here so you don't need to put a percentage so whenever you're answering questions with numbers make sure you look at what the trend looks like on the table or on the graph and use that as a way to answer your question all right and they did say here write your answer in the table to the nearest whole number so they're saying to you don't use any decimals make sure you only use whole numbers so in this case the answer was 257.14 um so i if you were to approximate that it still takes you to 257 so i'll keep it at 257 all right now let's look at the next question it says with reference to figure 2.2 and table 2.1 Describe the changes to the grey wolf populations in Southwest Europe from 1970 to 2012. So obviously, if you're looking at just the figure, you might not be able to see much because all you can see is that, um, well, they seem to have occupied a, a much larger population. So let me see. I think I'll use a green pen here. I just feel like trying out different colors. So don't be alarmed at all so we can see for number three over there that's not a great color you need something a bit darker so you can see it um it's a darker green okay so number three which is the italian um seems to have increased so if you look at in 1970 it was quite a scattered population um but in 2012 it seems to have formed a more close-knit community if you look at that um, and also, if you look at the numbers, you can see that it increased significantly by 700%. So that is a lot, right? Um, for number two, which is Ceremona, this seems to be a decrease. So number two has decreased. And you can see that it's minus 90. Um, number one has also increased in size. So this is number one. By 2012, it has increased. And number four did not exist before. Um, in 1970 but now it exists in 2012 let's look at the question again it says describe the changes so in this case you're not being asked to give any explanations for what you are seeing you're simply being told to look at the table and the image and say what you see so the first thing you can start with number one so you can say um, I think this is a three or four mark question I can't remember um, but you should check it out so you can say the Iberian population increased by um 257 percent which is what we calculated earlier so you can say it's plus 257 um increased by 257 percent um within the same within the same area of the map right within the same area of southwest europe and then you say number two um number two decreased so that's um syria mona number two decreased and you can say possibly due to migration right maybe they migrated or due to competition again you're not required to explain um you're only required to describe and then number three over here was a scattered population before and then um, it increased in number significantly and you can also go ahead to say based on the numbers you have here that the italian population had the highest increase in population of um of the gray wolf right so you can also include that and you can say that gray wolf started a new settlement in number four um, which is this one over here, um, which did not exist in 1970. So they started a new settlement in the Alpines and that did not exist in 1970, which is why there was no calculation for percentage change. So just listing the things that you see, because the question says here, describe, um, would give you your answers here. All right. Okay, so this is our last slide. Um, in regions of southwest europe where gray wolf populations are present farmers are concerned for the safety of their livestock such as sheep suggest how governments can help farmers who are concerned for the safety of their livestock so these kinds of questions you would typically get in biology and i know students usually tell me this is an unfair question because it sort of requires you to step into the shoes of a policy maker and sort of think of what the government would do um, and so for, the, for those who might be interested by the way i am now um, studying towards becoming a policy maker uh, so this for me is an exciting question this is like yeah i mean what would i do if i had farmers in my jurisdiction who were concerned about the safety of their lives 
livestock uh, because they have these wolves present and the the thing is i can't have them kill the wolves because i need to preserve um the biodiversity of the area but i also want to make sure that the farmers feel safe and their livestock are not lost so something i could do in this case is maybe i can just compensate the farmers right and that is what governments um tend to do um throw money at something um if it's if it's of this nature so compensate farmers for the loss of um of their wolves um of their livestock um, and to be honest, this is the only answer I can think of for now, but I'm pretty sure that the mark scheme probably has a different, a couple of different answers, but thankfully it's just one mark. Um, so that should answer it. Then it says suggest measures that could help protect wild populations of gray wolves in Southwest Europe. So these are basically measures that you would implement to prevent extinction. And an example of that would be, you can ban the hunting of gray wolves. So you can say people are not allowed to hunt gray, um, gray wolves and if they hunt them, um, they can maybe be fined or they can go to jail. Um, you can educate people on the importance of diversity um, in this regard of biodiversity. So you can use education. Um, you can also have, I think, sperm banks for the gray wolves. So these kinds of sperm banks are usually used for like things like cows and so on, um, but not just even sperm banks, even like frozen eggs and so on. So you can have um, a reserve of potential embryos that you can use to replace the gray wolf population. Um, so um, most of that is usually cl classified on the research. Um, and you can also, obviously, if you're going to ban hunting, you would have to be able to monitor the populations of um, gray wolves so that you can be sure that they are not being hunted or they are not dying from some random disease that's just killing them off. So, yeah, that is it on this video. That's all I'm going to do. Um, the full video will be for students who are on memberships. So do consider signing up for a membership. It is cheaper than a Netflix subscription. It's less than $7 a month. You can cancel at any time. So you can use it during your exam period. And once your exam's done, you can say to those goodbye and there will be no hard feelings. Um, but yeah, other than these short videos, there would be like the the ones that the students want memberships get uh, quite more detailed and more explanatory than these um, and also longer because they tend to get the full papers. Um, so, yeah, do consider it um, and I will sign out here until the next time. Goodbye.